Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by April Air, the trusted leader in indoor quality solutions. Through their understanding of consumer needs for indoor air quality and HVAC channel expertise, they help home builders leverage the full value and benefits of healthy home solutions. April Air has a full line of IAQ solutions that meet or exceed current and projected requirements for Energy Star certified homes and IECC. We've incorporated April Air products into our designs for years because they provide real value for engineered systems. For their full product line, check out aprilair.com backslash BSP. That's air with an E. The first step towards a healthier home is at aprilair.com backslash BSP. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the episode. Welcome to this. Okay. Oh, welcome to the Building Science. To the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin from Positive Energy, here as always with my trusty producer, Miguel. Hey, everyone. Today, we are going to be doing a talk, a conversation with Greg Long with IAQ Consulting Services out of Belton, Texas, on a subject that we've touched on in another episode. Um, we talked to Graham Marsh from Z Biosciences about biofilms and probiotic cleaners. Today, we're really going to get into the business end of that. Um, when I say business there, I mean basically the thermodynamic business end of an air conditioner is um, heat exchange. You know, let's just dig into that for a little uh, as a way of introduction. When we say air conditioning, Conditioning implies people. We're conditioning the air for people. And one of the things that people do in air conditioned air is enjoy the coolness of it. And the other thing they do is they breathe. So they're actually bringing that air into their, into their lungs, into their blood ultimately. And uh, well, before I go deeper down that route, heating is also conditioning the air for people. Although we don't call heating air conditioning. It is in fact for people. But in either case, heating or cooling, what we're doing is we're bringing air to a different temperature using a heat exchanger. And those heat exchangers are typically called coils. They're a lot like the radiator in your car. So it's, it's actually accurate to call a radiator, you know, a type of coil. And if you look at your radiator in your car, it's actually a good illustration to what we're going to be talking about today. What it has is it has antifreeze fluid, which is a thermally conductive fluid going through little tubes, and those tubes are connected to fins, and across the fins moves air, you know, comes in, flows across those fins. So what we're talking about when we're talking about biofilms and coils is we're actually talking about the surface of those little fins and the air that flows across them. Now, in a car, right, the sort of the business end of that is that it cools off the antifreeze, in an air conditioner, it's the opposite. You have a cold fluid, a refrigerant in the tube, and you want that coldness to be passed along to the airstream. And the way it does that is the tube makes the fin cold, while the refrigerant makes the tube cold, the cold tube makes the fin cold, and the cold fin makes the air cold. What happens when you make air cold is the water that's in it condenses out. So these fins, when you're in cooling mode, they are wet, so you have wet fins with the indoor air blowing across them, and that's where the fun begins. So we'll, be, we'll go ahead and introduce Greg now. Greg, are you on the line? I am. Okay, so I, I told folks that you were from IAQ Consulting Services out of Belton, Texas area. Would you like to give us a little bit uh, fuller introduction to who you are and what you do? Okay, Thanks. thank you, Christoph, and thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here. I started in the HVAC cleaning and restoration business in 1973. Hmm. Been, been involved in it uh, extensively ever since. Um, we started realizing probably back in the very early 90s that uh, cleaning coils was paramount in improving 
unit efficiency and making a unit work the way it's supposed to, to work. And we started putting a lot of time and research in the better ways to clean coils, keep them clean, and maintain them. And I've been very involved in the industry. I've served two terms on the board of directors of the National Air Duct Cleaners Association, served two terms as its president. I've been on the hmm. standard writing committee for that association for many, many years, and I'm still currently on the standard writing committee. I'm also hmm. in my uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Indoor Air Quality Association. I'm a treasurer for that association, finance committee chair, and that association is part of the ASHRAE family. So wow. I've been involved in the industry in, for, for a long, long time, and I really love this industry. It's, it's a fun, exciting industry, and we're seeing new things evolve all the time. Wow. Well, thank you for all that you're doing, man. On behalf of society, you're you're a busy man. You're doing a lot of do-goodery, serving on those committees, writing those standards. What about your firm? I mean, how, how do you uh, put food on the table? What are you doing on a day-to-day basis? I do a lot of consulting. Making work. money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do a lot of consulting work. Uh, do a lot of investigations for different people. Uh, on buildings for different situations. Um, I do a lot of commercial, specialized commercial HVAC coil cleaning and different things like that. Uh, Keep it diversified, uh, keep it fun, keep it interesting. So it's interesting that, you know, I I think about the coil as the, you know, the, the thermodynamic, the tip of the thermodynamic spear, right? The actual heat exchange is occurring as the air moves across those fins on the coil. And it's funny that I, I come to think about it more from the like surface chemistry standpoint, like what kind of microbiome, what kind of particles, bioaerosols, what's coming off of that coil, that wet, potentially, um, you know, growing coil. But you thinking about it from the efficiency angle, which means you're thinking about it from a heat exchange perspective. So let's just start at the beginning. So biofilms, which we covered in the other episode and I know you had a chance to listen to that, was biofilms, we define them as this sort of this mesh, this growing mesh layer that coats these fins. Are you saying that these biofilms impact heat exchange? Yeah, biofilms can, of course, they start out relatively very, very small, but if left, they they will continue to grow and become larger in mass. And, and to address the other part of your statement also is, yes, uh, we're also concerned with the um, microbiologicals that can blow out of these coils and downstream into the occupied space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured you were because you were on the IAQA board, and that's uh, air quality. It's uh, not necessarily just about efficiency. That's true. So they start thin. They, these films start thin and they grow. And they do impact heat exchange. How do we know they impact heat exchange? Are there studies or do you have anecdotal data or crunchy data to show that they do that? Yeah, there, there have been different studies showing that uh, different thicknesses of buildup on coal fins and how they impact the um, heat exchange of the device. And there's several of those that are available out there for people to go look at. But uh, Obviously, the thicker the buildup on the coil fins and coil tubes, the more impact it has. And it's amazing, you know, how quickly it starts <laughs> allowing the efficiency of the system to ramp down. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. is So the efficiency of the system is ramping down because of the presence of this biofilm. And it seems like there's two things that could be going on. One is the film's presence is actually like an insulating layer. And the second thing is that the film's thickness could restrict or block the air passages, which would, you know, decrease the amount of mass flow through the coil. Is it one or the other predominantly? Is, is it both? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's both. And to give a little bit of the history, um, when we started really taking a look at this, please, Back in the uh, early 90s, I was always searching for a better process and a better manner to clean coils. And mm-hmm. at the time, we were using a 
oxy high pressure hot water washer that put up about four GPM at about close to 4,000 PSI to clean coils. And I just, I just was not happy with the performance. And then I started doing some more research and I found a company that made a machine that would deliver temperatures upwards of 300, 310 degrees at 1500 PSI and two GPM. So I bought one of those machines and started experimenting with experimenting with it because when you understand the thermodynamics of water and when you get it hot, uh, how it changes your cleaning effect, you, I got very interested in that. So we purchased one of these machines and we started cleaning commercial coils with it. And just the, the results were tremendous. In fact, I had clients that uh, they, they, they would not allow anything, any other process to be used to clean their coils. The problem we found, though, is even after we got the coils clean with this machine, and it varied from case to case, it could be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. But with the uh, BAS systems on the uh, air handlers, you notice that the performance started ramping down again, and you understood, well, that coal didn't get that dirty that quick. So mm -hmm. we started studying it, and then you take some coals and start cutting them apart, and you realize that there's actually a biofilm growing inside these coals. Whoa. And uh, we back then, we did not have the probiotic products. We had... Uh, standard coal cleaning products, and we had biocides. But when you start studying um, biofilm, you understand that biocides don't get rid of biofilm. So mm, they don't. No. So we, we, you know, we knew we had a problem. And until, oh, six years ago or so, when I ran into Graham's company did, and asked them to develop a coal cleaner for us, did we have a solution to the biofilm? Fascinating. So you're telling me that you're saying that the that there were biofilms inside the coils. Are you saying there that these coils have multiple uh, rows or multiple layers of uh, coils and heat exchangers, and that the inner layers weren't getting as clean? That there were it was obvious that there was a biofilm there. Is that what you're saying? That, 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 that's that's true, and you you can take the. Uh, cut the coil apart, you can see where you've removed the dirt and the gross debris out, which, it, you know, it improves its performance and airflow. But you you still have um, a, a attached layer of biofilm in there. What's it and, look like? What's that mean that you had an attached layer? Is it like a slimy black thing? Is it white and well, fluffy? Uh, or what is it? What's it look like? It, or is it very... It, in a lot of cases, it actually, it, it, it does vary, but in a lot of cases, it's uh, kind of like a black attached film onto the coal fence. And like, that, like a black paint. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, okay. now this, this past week, we worked on a problem coal in a large built-up system, and uh, this is probably the extreme, but... We cleaned this coil and actually twice. And the first time we cleaned it, the drain pan actually filled up with a slimy green gray slime, kind of like a thick jello. And there was so much in it, it actually just filled the drain pan up. It was really bizarre. Yuck. So it was amazing. There and that coil was not getting any airflow through. Oh my gosh! So it was plugging the coil. Oh yeah, yeah. That that'll decrease heat exchange. That that'll ruin it. And so you talked about these building automation systems, these BAS systems. Um, they are not knowing that there's that there's a biofilm. So, but, but actually they do because they're just r running longer and longer to try to have these systems reach set point. But because of reductions both in airflow and thermal exchange, they're not. Is that right? Is that what's happening there? That, that's correct. Uh, we, mm. were for, we first had the probiotic coil cleaner developed. Uh, we had a, a large high-rise building that uh, was run by Heinz Property 
management. And they had a very good BAS system in it. They had a very good property engineer. And he allowed us to experiment on that building for a pretty long period of time. And one of the experiments, we'll back up a little bit, they were needing to clean the coils in this building in their large air handlers uh, at least once a year, if not twice a year. So we, we went in, cleaned the coal with uh, our cleaning process, which is, I call it, you know, it's superheated pressurized water. And then watch the performance of it over a few months. Then we went back, I think it was about six months later, and cleaned it again with the probiotic coil cleaner and looked at the performance of it. And there was a significant difference. Awesome. And then we, took, then we took a coil and on a periodic basis would go into it and spray a solution of just the probiotics without any surfactants or anything in it and just let it work in that coil. And you could watch on the uh, BAS systems a steady improvement in that coil over a period of time. I mean, over at least the first three weeks, it steadily and uh, kept getting better and better and better. That's impressive. So it, it wasn't that you cleaned it and it was instantly better. It was that it, well, it, you cleaned it, it was instantly better, and then it continued to get better after cleaning. That's, that's, that's so awesome. You must have been like, oh my gosh, we're onto something here. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, before we go too much more on this direction, Let's talk about, so I was mentioning surface chemistry, which is, or surface biology, actually, which is obviously at, at play here. Um, coils are not all made out of the same um, media, you know, so the growing media is going to be different. Coils are made out of typically copper, um, aluminum, and then you can get these coatings, you know, these epoxy coatings. Have you seen any difference, you know, whether it's a copper coil, aluminum coil or an epoxy coil with as far as biofilms uh with in regards between aluminum and copper the answer is no we found biofilm okay. in both aluminum and copper and uh a lot of people say um microbials don't grow in copper coils so that, that's absolutely not true it, it, they, huh. they do now uh, the, the coils that are factory coated are um, better until somebody goes in and starts washing that coil um, the wrong way. They can still get a uh, biofilm built up because you got to think uh, in, in most climates, particularly in our climate in the Gulf Coast climates, mm -hmm. uh, you, these coils are taking a lot of moisture out of the air every yeah. day. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. moisture that's retained inside those coils are being impacted with particulate and microbes continuously. And that's just the perfect recipe for something to grow in. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it, it can happen and does happen in, in, in all of them. But uh, one of the... Yeah. One of the and so... Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask about dirty sock syndrome. I mean, that's how, that was a session I attended at the IAQA conference that you presented. Um, so you're saying things grow and lots of things grow on coils uh, in terms of these biofilms. There's lots of different types of bacteria that's present there. How does dirty sock syndrome fit in? Dirty sock syndrome is, uh, it's called dirty sock because it's an odor that's emitted by the bacteria inside the coil that's when you smell it, it smells like dirty socks. So that's how <laughs> it got nicked, dirty sock syndrome. <laughs> and basically what it is, it's uh, bacteria and biofilm inside the coil and they are secreting isovaleric acid and that isovaleric acid smells like dirty sock. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's causing that odor and that's how it got nicknamed dirty sock syndrome. So it's associated with a biofilm. If you have dirty sock syndrome, yes. you've got a biofilm. And then the this isoglaric acid, that's just one, there's a certain type of bacteria that emits that, or, or is it many different types of bacteria? Uh, yeah, it, it, it can be many types of bacteria inside that, the wall. That'll emit that. 
Yeah. Wow. And so what is it that people call you in for? What's the complaint that they say, man, I need to call IAQ Consulting Services is it an energy problem? Is it is it often dirty sock syndrome or some sort of odor issue? Are there other, by the way, are there, before we go deeper, are there other odor issues besides dirty sock syndrome? <laughs> are there rotten egg syndrome or? <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you can get different, different odors out of the, the, the coils, but uh, the one that really is pronounced that people smell when the system is, you know, when, when it's, just right is the dirty sock syndrome. So yeah, it can be, okay. Uh, okay. it can be other things. And so if you have dirty sock syndrome, you probably also have heat exchange and airflow issues occurring. Is that right? You could, uh, it, you know, it, it just, it, it doesn't have to be, so much that it really affects the airflow. It might be affecting heat exchange a little bit, but it's definitely a signal. You've got something wrong going on inside the coil. Mm-hmm. And left, left unattended, it's going to get worse. So left unattended, then you'll definitely have some airflow and heat exchange impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What about the seasonality? I mean, you know, the, the coils are all wet and slimy in the summer, and then winter comes and they dry out. Um, it's actually kind of disturbing to think about it, but I guess what would happen is the some of that biofilm would desiccate and probably become friable or you know break up into particles and get moved back into the conditioned air, right into the airstream. Is, is that right, or what? What uh, happens in the winter? Yeah, that that's that frequently happens, and uh, a lot of times we'll get a call that. Um, our people are complaining about stuff blowing out on their desk or out on a conference table or something. Mm. And you go look at it and it's these little tiny balls that's tumbled down through the duct system. You, you touch them and they smudge. And that's just actually dried um, stuff coming out of the coil that's dried up in the heating season. Wow. Are, are it, could you describe the color of that or is it a variety or what do you usually it, it's, looks like? Soot. It's usually darker. Yeah, kind of like so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, so that's that's a pretty good exposition of the fact that um, there's a problem and that it's a thermodynamic problem, it's an indoor air quality problem, and that it's actually quite, uh, I don't know, what the, what's the right word, intimate with the occupants, meaning they're breathing this stuff potentially. Um so what right. do we do about it? And you've talked about you had these high pressure, high temperature cleaning systems, but it was really these um, probiotic cleaners that you have found to be very effective. How do you go about cleaning a coil with a probiotic cleaner? Well, let's start a little bit before that, please, Christoph. Uh, the ninety nine percent of the people out there have never been taught to proper procedure or chemistry to clean a coil. Just about all your coil cleaners out there on the market are a high pH of 11 to 14. Very, very caustic. And the, these cleaners, you know, they, they say uh, they, they, they foam it up and everything. They make the coils look bright. Yeah, they're making the coils look bright because they're damaging the coil. They're taking aluminum away. And when you use a, a high pH coil cleaner, um, it brightens the coil up, but actually what it's doing is damaging the coil inside. It's creating inside the, on the aluminum surface. And even though it looks good after it's clean, you're leaving a damaged surface that allows the coil to foul much quicker. And the reason it does, these pits hold and retain the water instead of let, allowing the water to roll off properly. And it, then... With that water held in there, then that water's collecting particulate and biologicals, and then you get the rapid regrowth in there and build up in there, and your performance falls off. So proper coal cleaning procedure is important. Proper chemistry is important. Mm -hmm. The way way most guys are cleaning coals out there, they're actually impacting the coal. I've run across so many coals that have been improperly cleaned, 
and have been impacted over time from improper coal cleaning procedures that they're totally stopped up. And uh, it, it's a shame because they have never been taught the proper coal cleaning procedures. Yeah, they're working hard. They're being disciplined. <laughs> they're not doing it right. Yeah. That is a shame. Well, they, 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 they can see about two rows deep in the coal and it looks bright and shiny and they think they've done a good job. Which, in fact, what they're doing, they're impacting. Yeah, they're the impact, and they're impacting the water shedding characteristics of an oil, a coil. That's that's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, they're impacting that, and they're impacting the center of the coil with dirt that never gets washed out. It just starts stacking on top of itself in there and gets thicker and thicker, and uh, uh, blocks the coil up on the inside. And you've measured this. You've seen like static pressures that are really high, and after measurement after uh, cleaning with yeah right. fascinating right i did a call not too long ago in houston that 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 situation had happened on and when we got through with it we increased um and we only worked on it for about five hours and we increased the airflow through it by 116 percent whoa wait a minute so you doubled it and then some i bet people noticed that they did they did <laughs> wow yeah they were getting Cool air where they hadn't had cool air yeah. in a long time. I mean, to just listeners, just so you can follow. I mean, when it is air conditioning, moving this heated and cooled air around the building, that's what it's all about, right? That's how we provide comfort is is all about airflow. Airflow, airflow, airflow. Um, so when you're impacting that, it's, it's deep impact. All right, so you're not using a high pH cleaner. You're not... Um, damaging the coil when you use these probiotic cleaners how do you apply them it depends upon the size of the coil for large commercial coils what we're using is an airless sprayer we're mixing the probiotic coil cleaner about 10 to 1 and we're applying it with a airless sprayer at about 3000 psi using the on it reverse so we can stream it deep into the coil and we coat both sides and we let it work as long as possible. Then we go through with a proper cleaning procedure along with a superheated pressure okay. water. And uh, uh, it works very, very well. And you say it keeps working after application. How long did you say? Several weeks? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, here, here's here's the, 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 the deal. We, with this probiotic coal cleaner being, since it's, pH neutral, we can actually apply it days in advance and let it stay in there and let the probiotics have time to work. And when we do that, we see a uh, a tremendous increase in how well it cleans. Now, there's obvious times you don't have an opportunity to apply it days mm-hmm. in advance. So for on this project I was on this week, um, we cleaned the coal, went in, applied the probiotics, cleaned the coal, and it was shocking how much dirt we got out. Then before we left, we reapplied the probiotics, let it work in there for 24 hours, and came back and cleaned a second time, and just completely blown away with how much more debris we got out of the coal. I've got contractors that's actually applied the coal cleaner eight days in advance sometimes three or four days in advance. And when you do that, it just, the coil cleaning turns out so much better on the first time through. Now, using the superheated pressurized water, because we're introducing water into the coil close to um, 265 to 300 degrees, we're obviously killing the probiotics that we have introduced in there. So after we have cleaned, then we go back and sp- spray another product in there that's just strictly probiotics and uh, allow it to allow those probiotics to continue to work inside the coil. The biofilm will reemerge potentially, right? At some point, correct? Yeah, the bio- biofilm will always reemerge unless you do uh-huh. something to prevent it. That's we've had, uh, we're, we've got a client that. In fact, uh, the client that let us experiment, what they did is they set up an automated spray system that would spray these coils 
with a probiotic twice a week or I forget, I think it was like five minute intervals twice a week to keep probiotics introduced into those coils. And after that was done, after they were cleaned and that was done, those coils that had to be cleaned once or twice a year, four years later, when that mechanical engineer retired, still did not need to be cleaned. So once or twice a year, that's, that's not too big a deal. And so once or twice a year, somebody would climb in. I mean, these are big coils. I assume some of these are commercial coils or they're, they're using a sprayer somehow once or twice a year. Um, and that's how you do it. There's no way to automate it or to. No, 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 no. That's what I said. They, they allowed us to install an automated ah, system okay. that would, uh, fog those coils twice, twice a week. week. Okay. Like I misunderstood. Or... Not twice a year. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah, no, they, they previously, the coils had to be cleaned once or twice a year, but after we installed the automated spray system, they, 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 it was a period of four years that they didn't I need see. to be okay. cleaned. I totally had that upside down. So the automated spray system is going a couple times a week. Um, and then you avoid, I'm just thinking about the economics of the situation. I guess ultimately, into, because there's so many layered impacts, right? There's heat exchange, there's comfort, there's energy use, um, durability of the coils. Does that more than outweigh the cost of installing this automated application system? Oh, ab- absolutely. The return on investment is very good. So if you defer having to clean the coil twice, three times, you've paid for the cost of the manifold delivery system, or is it one time? Yeah, it, it, it actually depends upon the size of That's the system. And, uh, you know, uh, larger systems require larger uh, engineered spray system. Uh, we, we've got some clients that just actually put it in a ULV fogger and send somebody in once a week or once every two weeks and just yeah. fog it. And, you you know, you leave that running so the air handler can pro, pull the probiotics through the coil. Do you know if anyone's ever tried this in a residential context? I mean, like a manifold delivery system for probiotic coil cleaning? No, I don't, I don't think yeah, that's been done yet. I don't yet. think so either. Residential coils are relatively thin. So you can clean them a little more readily, but still, if you have these high pH, you know, yeah. coil damaging caustic caustic pH levels, that's not a good thing. I mean, I've seen coils foamed all the time, and I, I was going to comment on some of the foils, I, uh, foils coils I've seen uh, over the years, residential coils. Um, man, they can get just very, very nasty looking. I mean, we used to have one here at our office that we would show people, and it looked like someone threw up on it. Yeah, exactly. I was trying to think of the, yeah, it was just so nasty. We eventually got rid of it because it's like, this is almost like fear mongering or this is just so over the top nasty. No one's going to actually believe that this is what the coil looked like when we took it out of this house. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the problems with residential is depends upon where the system is, how it's installed. A lot of residential systems are not well installed and the the, the returns are not truly direct connected to the right. occupied space. Now, for instance, in my house, my return is directly connected to my occupied space. So what I do, I use a high quality filter. I put the, uh, it, my filter grill so large, it actually takes two filters. So I put the filters in and then I take tape. Uh, masking tape and take the edges of the filters to the filter mm-hmm. frame so that I'm all the air through. Yeah, the no filter. coil, no filter and bypass. The, you reduce filter bypass. No filter, no, no filter bypass. And uh, my evaporator coil developed a leak after it was in five years and uh, had to have it replaced. And when they pulled it down out of the attic, I was here and I looked at it. And it was shocking how clean that filter was for being five years old because I force all the air through a high quality filter. Now, yeah, unfortunately, some residential systems are not designed where you can do that. And they've got uh, open plenums at the bottom of the units that's connected to uh, uh, wall cavities that sucking dirt out of the attic and so forth. And it's hard to. It's hard to tape a filter that slides in the slot of a, 
the bottom of an air handler and stuff. So everybody doesn't have that ability to do, but if they, you know, uh, it's very important to make sure that that return is sealed from any wall cavities or anything that could connect it to the attic where there's, you know, undesirable air that you don't want sucked into Absolutely. the air. Yeah. Now you're talking, now you're in the realm of building science where it's a system. And if you want clean, 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 healthy yes. air, it's not like, well, let me have the clean, healthy air filter or the clean, healthy air air handler it's like the, the whole system start to finish okay so back to your house greg so you you had a clean coil after five years so not all coils develop biofilm growth is that right no no not all coils now yet i know of many times over the years that there have been homes that have dirty sock syndrome so some coils in homes do develop biofilm growth absolutely yeah and so it's interesting and and it's not like oh well, if i don't have my air doesn't smell like dirty socks therefore i don't have a biofilm because one type of the biofilm bacteria emits this isoglaric acid and causes the odor it's not right so it's interesting it's it's almost like uh, you don't know <laughs> yeah that's true you, you you can't always smell it and I, I i contribute a lot of uh the success of mine to the fact that i do have a positive connection of the return to the mm -hmm. occupied mm -hmm. space and i do take them I don't yeah, have filter yeah, bypass. That's so important. And in addition, I, I tape all the access panels on my air handler so that, you know, nothing leaks around them and so yeah. forth. So I, I'm, I make sure that the air passing through is coming directly from the occupied space where it's passing through a very good quality filter. Well, I see in a lot of these homes where they do install a very expensive, high-efficiency four inch filter systems but when you sit there and look at them they're they're they fit sloppy in the housing uh, and there's not they don't fit tightly to prevent exactly air right. bypass mm -hmm. closet upflow systems it's often nigh on impossible to get a good seal between the air handler chassis and the supply plenum or the return plenum at the back of that closet attic, attic systems sometimes are tucked over you know close to where the roof and the attic floor are so how the heck can the installer get behind you know the system to seal that chassis plenum connection you know there's just so many layers of and frankly one of the one of the issues in is that um installing contractors should complain they, they should call you know they should call a spade a spade and say I don't have proper access to do a good quality installation here. I don't know. Somehow it's like the culture of the industry is I'll just do the best I can in the circumstances and not mention any issues. Keep going. <laughs> wow. So we've covered a lot of ground, Greg. We went through what's causing the growth of these films, what the films do, how you clean them. How about epoxy coatings and those foaming cleaners that you mentioned? I mean, it's, this is off the subject of sort of probiotic film uh, coil cleaning but when you foam it foam up a coil if it's an epoxy coil how does that work does it dissolve the epoxy coating or one of the things i've seen frequently is the guys using the high ph coil cleaners don't really understand the importance of rinsing all that residue out of the coil because that high ph ah. residue will remain in there and if you've got a uh, biofilm or particulates lodged in the depths of that coil, and and they uh, the high pH coil cleaner um, clings in there, holding onto that stuff. If it's not thoroughly thoroughly rinsed, then you've got that high pH coil cleaner in there slowly over time doing damage to to the coil, and we've seen that many times. And, and this is this is the damage that causes it to causes like pitted or the surface damage on the coil. Can it damage the coil so much to cause a refrigerant leak? Uh, probably could. Um, I've actually, you know, I've seen lots of lots of cases where it uh, actually damaged the frame around the coil. And uh, but yeah, it's it you know if it could it could possibly if. The, uh, particularly if you've got uh, thin aluminum tubes, uh, could damage them over a period of time also. Yeah. Wow. And then the probiotic cleaners, um, 
you know, let's say, so I, let's say I have, I have an air conditioner at my home. So I do have an air conditioner at my home I and hope so. <laughs> my coil has never been cleaned, you know, knock on wood here. I haven't had any problems. Now I have looked at my supply plenum and I've got mold in there and it's, it's not a pleasant sight. Um, but my coil hasn't been cleaned. So if I ever do clean it, now that I've met you and talked to you, I sure as heck am not going to use a high pH coil cleaner. Could I use a probiotic cleaner? I could tell my installer, spray that in there, wait a few hours. And how does that work? And he rinses it or it doesn't even need to rinse it. How does that work? Yeah. It, or she, I should say. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. If it's been a few years since it's been cleaned, it, yeah, it needs to have dwell time to work. And then it needs to be thoroughly uh, rinsed out to get all the particulate and everything out of the coil. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that we pull the coil out of the air handler, take it outside and do this treatment, or it's happening in the air handler? I've done it both ways. It's always better if you can get the air, uh, coil out of the air handler. I like to get them outside, take the pan off of them, take the top plate off of them, and that way I can get everything clean real well. Sometimes it's not feasible to get them outside, then we'll clean them in place, but always prefer to take them outside if possible. Well, it did sound, there was that one application you mentioned with the manifold application system. So that was definitely not being taken out. It was just happening bi-weekly. There was a spray application of this probiotic cleaner, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So it seems like you get a new house, you got a new clean coil. If there was some way just a couple times a week or maybe even once a week to have a like a mist or a fog of a probiotic moving through that coil from the return. seems like that could work. What do you think? I mean, we're speculating, I know, but. No, it absolutely would work. I think there's a product out here now. We should, we should talk offline after this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let me, let me summarize. I mean, basically uh, we talked about the coil is the, the thermodynamic business end of heating and cooling and indoor air quality. You know, so it impacts comfort, impacts you know, health potentially with indoor air quality. It impacts energy use, coil durability. We've now learned that the conventional ways to clean the coils can impact water shedding, that biofilms can impact heat exchange through an insulating layer. They can reduce airflow. Um, these biofilms can release, you know, bioaerosols, which are particles. They can release odors. It's wild. There's so much to know. And this is the first time I've heard of it was talking to you. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Is there anything that we've missed? Any topics that you're thinking, oh, he should have asked me about that? I, I don't think so. I think we pretty much hit the top of all of them. I think we, we got it covered, Christoph. I think, I think we did too. Well, then, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, good luck in all you're doing. Keep up the good work out there. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I appreciate it, Christoph. Thank you for the invite. And thank you all for listening. We'll talk at you next time. This episode is brought to you by the Humid Climate Conference. Back in 2015, the Austin chapter of Passive House Alliance US was thinking about how to get more attention to the FIAS Plus 2015 standard in humid climates. And so the thought emerged, what if we put on a conference? I'm proud to tell you that this is an unmissable conference. It's a unique gathering of the best building science minds who are ready to talk seriously about passive house and humid climates. This event is entirely volunteer organized, supported by Passive House Institute US, and sponsored by some of the best product manufacturers and industry consultants in the country. And it's sold out in its first try. But it's happening again this year, May 21st and 22nd, with a great speaker lineup. We're talking Joe Stebrick, Lou Harriman, Richard Corsi, Matthew Tanteri, and the list literally goes on and on and on. Find out more at humidclimateconference.org. Early bird tickets are limited and they're selling quickly, so don't miss out and be left wondering. Register today. That's humidclimateconference.org for tickets. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode.